Good afternoon, field trippers, and welcome to El Cerrito Virtual Field School, our first meeting in the village. I hope you all had a safe journey here and uh, drove slow on the road into the village. I noticed it was in pretty bad shape today after that last rain and the ruts and whatnot that uh, we had to drive around coming in today. I want to remind you today we're going to talk about the geographic perspective. Briefly, you've all had that as students of mine and how this topic is geographical. I want to talk about homelands and the definition that geographers use. We'll look some at the Spanish homelands in the United States. We're going to take a look at the emphasis of those three uh, Spanish homelands, uh, look at the environments of the three Spanish homelands with emphasis on northern New Mexico and how that's different than other homelands. That will help explain some of the reasons why uh, things have been different there. And finally, we'll talk about uh, some of the actual processes of innovation, invention, and diffusion that account for the uh, uniqueness of the Hispano homeland. Remember with geography, it's interdisciplinary, and we're going to be pulling data from lots of disciplines, and we use it to observe anything that's distributed across space. And if you can map something, then it is distributed across space. We can map the homeland, so we're definitely going to be looking at something spatially distributed. First thing we'll do is talk about that spatial distribution, the Hispano homeland, and, and where it is and what it's like. Then we're going to investigate the underlying spatial process is responsible for the uh, observed distribution of the homeland. And then later in the course, we'll be talking some, of course, about uh, some predictions we might make about the homeland in the future. This map shows the three Spanish homelands uh, that we're considering. The California homeland on the west coast was pretty much a coastal phenomenon and is characterized by the chain of missions that run up through California. The Tejano homeland is the one that we're probably most familiar with. That occurs right here, focused on uh, San Antonio by and large. And then the Hispano homeland, if you look at the map, you'll see it's located in uh, northern New Mexico. What's important to think about, to know about the Hispano homeland at the present time, is that first of all, it was the first one settled. It was settled in the late 1500s, so it's much older than the other two uh, Spanish homelands. And it was settled more directly from Spain. The, the people who came to New Mexico came fairly directly from Spain, came to Mexico, but were not there long, so didn't undergo very much cultural change. And when they moved into New Mexico, they brought uh, the Spanish culture very intact, and that's going to be the basis for our definition. The environments play a different role too, and this is going to be important when we talk about the innovation, invention, and diffusion. Um, if we take a look at the uh, homeland in, in Texas, the Tejano homeland, I know you've read, read the little at piece on this, um, it's exactly what we experience here. Uh, long hot summers, uh, uh, cool winters, uh, shorter winters, uh, great variability in drought and wet spells overall. And uh, one thing that, that's going to make, that this environment's going to make attractive to uh, Anglos and others later is that there's an abundant amount of uh, cultivatable farm, cultivatable farmland in the area and also great grazing land for raising cattle. The California homeland probably has the best uh, environment of all of them. The, uh, uh, with the Mediterranean climate, the summers are warm but not often terribly hot. They're dry. The rain comes in the winter, but the winters are cool. It's a very pleasant kind of, uh, of, an, of environment. Uh, with irrigation, there's a lot of opportunities for widespread agriculture in that homeland today. It also possesses a number of minerals that uh, uh, settlers later would find attractive. The Spano homeland, on the other hand, up in northern New Mexico, it's above 5,000 feet above sea level. It's a very dry environment. It's cool, very cold in the winters. The summers are mild with some hot days. But the thing I think that's most important is that there are no wide-scale agricultural opportunities in the Hispano homeland. There are opportunities along the rivers and the river valleys, but you don't have the grand amount of agricultural land that we find both in Texas and the California homelands. The Hispano homeland, if we look at it, is not, is not the only homeland in the United States. There were a number of them. I give you this one just to look at. Uh, we can see the homelands in, uh, in, in Louisiana and Florida and across the upper Midwest. But we're focused very much in this northern New Mexico arid region, highland region, and also very isolated, uh, not very heavily populated today and never has been. 
So let's talk about this term homeland. It's an uncertain concept, and uh, researchers and publishers are often talking, tr having debates about what a homeland really is. Um, the best example I could find, and I'm drawing on uh, an article that uh, Dr. Nostrand, who uh, will provide much of our material for this class, in uh, conjunction with uh, Dr. Lawrence Esteville in 2001, worked on the idea of that, first of all, a homeland must have people. And they have an ethnic identity, a unifying ethnic identity. Uh, you could think of that as almost a national identity. They have a self-conscious awareness, a sense of who they are, a sense of belonging to each other. They see themselves as somewhat unified and different from outsiders. So the first, thing, first critical aspect of a homeland is people. The second is they have to occupy place or territory. In this case, we'll be looking at the northern New Mexico region. And along with that, we have a bonding with the place. People have been in that place long enough, have adapted to it, learned to make their living there, that they develop an emotional feeling of attachment. They belong there. This is their land. And they leave their impress in the form of the cultural landscape. We'll be looking at the kinds of structures they built and, and the other infrastructures, the irrigation ditch and the dams and things. And as you wander around the village in El Cerrito, you'll see a number of these have been very accurately uh, recreated. And that's what is a sense of home. People see this landscape and they say, this is home. I've occasionally encountered um, elderly people coming back to El Cerrito who have moved away years before, or maybe moving to California, Colorado. They get back into this Hispano homeland and in, into this area, and they say it feels like home. It looks like home. They have this bonding with place. And then and for a place to be a homeland, the people who live there that have this sense of identity also have control of the place, and they desire to possess it, a, a compulsion to defend that thing about the motherland. Uh, oftentimes, people are willing to fight to the death in order to protect their homeland. It facilitates the, the bonding. And then they need to have been there long enough to bond. A homeland doesn't evolve as soon as people move there. When new migrants come into an area, they often feel like strangers. Uh, they're, they're uncertain of the environment and the place they live. But over time, they learn about it. And so we're going to find that it was this sense of belonging to the homeland that allowed the, the people in, in the Hispano homeland to cling to that homeland, even during the Depression, during hard economic times when jobs had dried up. But this was their home, and so they they stayed there. That was the one place they knew, even though times were very, very difficult for them. Um, I want to put this slide up because our, our, the person who inspired all this work, uh, the gentleman in the red sweatshirt taking a photo of us right now, Dr. Richard Nostrand. I first met him in 1981 when I uh, went into the graduate program of geography at uh, the University of Oklahoma. And for many years, he brought field trips of, stu of students out into the homeland to help them understand the historical cultural ecology and historical geography that, that he does out there. The uh, picture in the upper right shows one of the field trip groups uh, nearby in the homeland over at the uh, Pecos Pueblo. Uh, you see Dr. Nostrand on the right in his vest, and he uh, went to great effort to bring students here for many, many years, and probably uh, several hundred have been brought uh, to this region for study by him. To the lower left is a picture of a house. Uh, I took this picture on the way driving into El Cerrito once we begin to get on the small back roads. And the red uh, that you see on the porch, those are ristras. And one of the major food staples in the Spano homeland is, is green chili. And the green chili can be roasted and eaten fresh uh, during when it's in season. But because of the importance of it as a food supply and flavoring, uh, the Hispanos would uh, string it, long strings of green chilies, hang them in the sun, and the dry air in the sun would work to dry them and turn them red. You may see these at farmer's markets around here. They're kind of a, a favorite decorating item. So we are continuing a tradition that Dick Nostrand began some 30 years ago. These are some of the major works that we'll be drawing on and that Dick has done. The Hispano Homeland was his first book. Uh, that's where he actually documents the larger region of the Hispano Homeland. Uh, many years uh, of, of being in the field, doing library work. Dr. Nostrand spent a semester in Mexico at a university on a fellowship improving his Spanish to do the many hours of library and archive work. More recently, uh, the El, El Cerrito, New Mexico, eight generations in a Spanish village 
village represent this is his second book and here he's gone through the entire history of the village where we are working today identifying uh, uh, each generation who the early settlers were what the major social issues were the third uh, book cover I have up there is the homelands uh, book and that covers homelands throughout the United States but that's where uh, I drew my uh, definition from homelands and we see a picture of Dr. Nostrand in the lower left uh, talking with uh, one of the local residents who's now moved to Las Vegas but John Burke Burns, who uh, was one of the early Anglo people that moved into the village in the late 1970s. So we think about culture and cultural change, and or the lack of change. Actually, in the case of El Cerrito and the Hispano homeland, it's the lack of change. It didn't change. And to understand that, I think it's important for us to understand how culture changes. All culture can only change in two ways. Anytime a culture changes, food, clothing, shelter, ideas, technology, social organization, gender roles, whatever, you name it, it can only change in one of two ways. Number one, the people can think it up themselves. They can innovate it. They can invent it. But it's not very likely. Uh, people don't think up lots of changes on their own. In many cases, changes are thought up other places. And more likely, those changes appear through the process of spatial diffusion. Uh, that's how innovation spread from place to place. Uh, uh, ideas, food preferences, music types, they, they're innovated in a place, and then they spread across space as a function of, of spatial diffusion. I'll talk about the types of diffusion in a minute. What's going to be critical for us in the Hispano homeland is that these barriers can exist. Barriers to diffusion slow or stop the change resulting from diffusion. And we're going to find that unlike the Tejano and the California homeland, the Hispano homeland had a substantial number of barriers, economic and environmental and cultural, that really served to keep outside culture from coming in, from changes taking place. Now, don't misunderstand me certainly changes took place, but these barriers slowed it down tremendously. And in the absence of diffusion, little change is expected to occur. And later we will make the argument that El Cerrito is an archaic folk culture, and that means that that culture was isolated from the larger culture around it. And because of that, few changes took place, which meant that the culture remained the way it was, became old-fashioned, if you will, when compared to the newer culture that emerges. And hence, we use the term archaic. So let's talk about the innovation invention process. Diffusion is the way things spread across space, and it can happen in two ways. There's relocation diffusion, which is human migration. That's where the same number, same people with culture move from one place to another, take the culture with them. And then there's expansion diffusion, and that's when an idea, a concept, a belief, a food preference, whatever, moves through a culture to more and more people. It moves from person to person to person. So let's take a look first of all. The first kind of diffusion I want to talk about is relocation diffusion, human migration. If I were to ask how did Spanish culture get to New Mexico, it had to be diffusion. Certainly people didn't move to New Mexico, decide to study Spanish and, 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 and Spanish cooking and Spanish language and, and build in Spanish architecture. That culture was transplanted there by the process of migration. And if migration is voluntary, it is due to both push and pull factors. These are perceived factors of the people who are moving. Push factors are things people perceive about where they are that cause them to want to move. And pull factors are what people perceive about all the places they might go. The place with the strongest pull factor is probably where people are going to want to go. So if a person loses their job, that might be a push factor for them to move. And then where they would go would be, would move, would be a place where they think that jobs are better. Push and pull factors are, are operating here. In the case of the Spanish, the push factors were a lack, loss of, lack of economic opportunities where they were, and the pull factors were largely a desire to go and find new land, start a new life, establish a new place. So you have the same knowers, the same adopters, but they move or migrate and take their cultural economic experiences with them. The way of life goes to the new location. So if we look at the three uh, Spanish homelands, the 
the uh, migrants went into uh, to the Hispano homeland much, much earlier and more directly from Spain. Hence, they had far less of an opportunity to have their culture weakened. So we get this initial migration. Remember, it was the king of Spain himself who authorized the land grant, that uh, the various land grants in which they make up the uh, uh, Hispano homeland. Once people get where they're going, um, ideas can move in or out of a place due to expansion diffusion. And that kind of diffusion uh, can operate in three ways. There's hierarchical diffusion, contagious diffusion, and stimulus diffusion. And if we think about those terms and what they mean, remember it's, it's, it's moving an idea, a concept, a belief, a way of life is moving to more and more people. Hierarchical diffusion occurs when something spreads in a hierarchical manner from, from level of one important place to another. For example, if a new heart-lung transplant technology was developed at the uh, 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 UT Medical Center in, in Houston, that was certainly diffused to other parts of the country, but it wouldn't spread evenly. It was spread in a leapfrog hierarchical manner to other high-level, high-technology research teaching hospitals. New fashions are like that when they first come out, from Paris or London. Though in the United States, they go to New York, to Chicago, uh, to Los Angeles, and it takes a while for them to, to work on through the society. So we're looking at hierarchical diffusion as a way that things can spread. The second type of diffusion is contagious diffusion. And this is when a, a culture trait or characteristic spreads like a contagious disease. It moves fairly uniformly through a society. Not everyone adopts it in most cases, but it spreads in a fairly contagious uniform manner. Uh, think if you were to pour some dye into a swimming pool, how it would just spread out. That would be a, an example of the spatial implication of contagious diffusion. Then finally, there is stimulus diffusion, and that's where an idea, concept, or a belief spreads to a place, but when the people adopt it, they don't adopt it exactly as it comes, but they modify it to meet their own cultural preferences, needs, and beliefs. If we think about how the Spanish language and the Catholic religion got to the Western Hemisphere, we can get, demonstrate these types of diffusion. Certainly, we could say that Mexico is largely Catholic today. Did the Catholics invent, or did the, did the Mexicans invent Catholicism? Not at all. They received it by the process of diffusion. And that was a, a relocation diffusion where people literally migrated, moved from Spain to Mexico, and took their religion with them. Once they got to Mexico, and they brought this religion, they began to spread out. And, and the, the clergy and the political administrators set up important administrative centers. And so the religion next went to those centers in a hierarchical manner, going to the administrative centers in Mexico. Then the local clergy began to spread out, and they attempted to achieve contagious diffusion of, of spreading the, the religion of Catholicism. They tried to convert everyone. And indeed, the indigenous peoples often accepted uh, Catholicism, except on the surface. In many cases, their life and well-being depended upon it. But they didn't throw away their old religion. Religions are things that hang on to pe up with people. They're very strong and enduring. And so we see that the indigenous people, for example, in southern Mexico, yes, they adopted the, the, the uh, Cath Cath Catholic religion and the tenets that go with it, but they also maintain much of their own indigenous religion, the belief in spirits and, and, and those things. So the, the way Catholicism is practiced in Chiapas is different from the way it's practiced uh, in the Vatican, say, uh, when the Pope offers a mass. And so there's an example of all three of these kinds of diffusion. What's going to be important to us is that we're going to be looking at, at the Hispano homeland and we're going to see that, that, that the culture is planted there through the process of, of migration, of relocation, diffusion. But then we're going to talk about the barriers that are set up, the economic and, and the political barriers that are going to slow additional diffusion of, of, of outside culture, the Anglo culture, and later the larger emerging popular culture, Chicano uh, uh, culture, into that region. And, and those barriers are going to help that, that uh, culture in the Hispano homeland stay the same, make very few or limited changes. Um, I want to take a look now and talk about the archaic folk culture. 
Remember, we're talking about people who live in a place, have a sense of, of belonging. And if you look at those three homelands, although they were settled at different times, um, one thing that's important to note, all three of those homelands received their Spanish culture through the process of relocation, diffusion, migration. Push and pull factors drew uh, Spanish-speaking, Spanish-cultured people into all three of these regions. Um, what we're going to see happen is that in California, uh, in the middle 1800s, uh, valuable minerals were found there, gold primarily and others. That served as an extremely powerful pull factor that brought large numbers of Anglos to the, to the gold fields. And as the Anglos came into California in pursuit of gold, or if they weren't directly golding, perhaps uh, working in related support industries, uh, uh, running hotels or brothels, that sort of thing, that began to dramatically dilute the, uh, Mexico, the, the Spanish culture there. In the Tejano homeland, we know the same thing was very true. Uh, the Tejano homeland uh, persisted for a good while during the Spanish era. During the Spanish era, the Spaniards did not want uh, uh, any uh, outside Anglos really going into the area. But during the Mexican era, the Mexicans realized that if they didn't populate the area, that there would be some problems. And so they began to allow people like Stephen Austin and others to come in and begin to settle. And of course, the, the new Anglo settlers promised to always be loyal to the king and be good Catholics, but they really didn't do that. And that was followed by increasing waves, particularly with Texas independence, of large numbers of Anglos coming into Texas because of the land resources, opportunities to make a living in economic development. But the Hispano homeland, none of that was the case. It didn't possess minerals. It didn't possess big tracts of agricultural land. And so it was largely bypassed uh, uh, by Anglos in large numbers. Again, like the other homelands, the Hispano homeland uh, was isolated by the king of Spain during the Spanish era, and no Anglos were really allowed to enter into the area. When the Mexican era starts, when Mexico gets its independence from Spain, this area begins to open up, and we begin to get trade traders and uh, merchants and explorers coming into the Hispano homeland, primarily along the Rio Grande River. And this is going to be important because the village we're setting in today sets on the Pecos River. And the early settlement in, in the Rio Grande uh, focused uh, largely on Santa Fe and Taos and Albuquerque, those cities. Uh, by about the late 1700s, population had grown so much that there was a scarcity of land. And so the king of Spain uh, provided authority to the Alcalde of Santa Fe to make new land grants. And in the late 1700s, the Alcalde in Santa Fe authorized the uh, land grants along the Pecos River. And between then and about 1825, large numbers of, of, of Hispanos, and remember, they've been largely isolated. This culture came more directly from Spain and much earlier, has been largely preserved because it's not being impacted by the outside influence of diffusion of outside cultures. And so in the late 1700s, very early 1800s, a large number of these people take this wonderful, archaic culture, probably during its golden heyday, and transplant it by migrating over to the Pecos River and beginning to set up villages there. Shortly after that happened, in 1832, the Mexican era begins, and at that time, Anglos begin to come in in small numbers, but they're mostly restricted along the Rio Grande River. So the area we're in along the Pecos continues to continues during this time to be much more isolated, and I'll make the case later, continues to be far more uh, uh, pure in, in its, in its uh, nature, in its cultural nature, because there is very little innovation invention going on there, and there's very little spatial diffusion. Other kinds of homelands we might think of to get a sense of, of how these operate. Uh, the English speakers that went into the Appalachian Mountains and virtually disappeared for a hundred years. During that time they lived there, they were not being impacted by a diffusion of culture from outside. And so they remained very archaic, very old fashioned. When they finally were rediscovered, a lot of that driven by the uh, coal mining industry, uh, outside culture encounters these people and they're amazed at their old timey life 
lifestyle. Uh, this has been popularized in TV shows and movies like the Beverly Hillbillies, who actually try to make fun of this archaic folk culture. But these people were essentially 100 years behind in cultural transition. The French in Canada, very much the same way. French settled a substantial area of Canada, but then the British uh, uh, took over political and economic control, and those French speakers became largely isolated from the larger body of French culture, French-speaking people in Europe. Because of that, the French culture in France continued to evolve and modernize, but the French Canadians, losing that contact of uh, not having the impact of spatial diffusion, uh, uh, didn't change much, and their language remained somewhat of an archaic form. Well, this is what happened to the Hispanos. The people that moved up into northern New Mexico were isolated from outside cultural influences and hence tended to change very, very little. And so we see that it was geographic isolation that helped preserve the spatial distribution of the Hispano archaic folk culture. And so what we're planning on doing is uh, your next reading and the things that you'll be doing next time will be to... Uh, look more in depth at the aspects of the archaic folk culture to learn more about it so we can discuss it and look more deeply. I encourage you to look um, around the village, look for examples of things that look old-timey. Uh, certainly there's a lot of new junk and stuff there as well. But look at the kinds of construction. Uh, the, this, uh, this creation of this digital environment is extremely accurate and follows true to what you'd actually see in the village. The adobe structures, the, the uh, sun-dried mud bricks, which we who visited there have made. Local building material, of course they would. You couldn't go out to the local Lowe's or BMF, BMI lumberyard. There wasn't such a thing. They were pretty much a self-contained group of people. The way they grew their food, the, the livestock that they raised, uh, the irrigation, the maintenance of the ditch, the customs stayed very much old-fashioned. People didn't leave the village much. Men did to go out and get jobs, and I will tell you that story next time. But women and children largely stayed there most of their life. Women might leave the village if they married someone from, from a different village, but in many cases that was somewhere else still in the Hispano homeland and quite possibly in the Pecos enclave. So I want you to walk around the village and um, take a look, uh, explore things, uh, be thinking about this, do the reading and think about this whole concept of archaic folk culture and how the geographic processes of innovation, invention and diffusion have played a role in that. And as an incentive to uh, get around the village, Robin tells me that she has uh, posting an incentive on tracks where you can go and earn another bundle of lindens. Now, and, and you do not need to report lindens on your financial statement for income tax or if you're running for political office. That you don't need to turn those in. But she's going to be posting on tracks an opportunity for you to win some additional lendings, should you choose, it's voluntary, to, uh, to, to make, some, make some, go out and explore around the village and, and do some activities. For sure, look at the irrigation ditch. Without that technology, the village would not exist because it's too dry for farming. That's a technology that they brought with them from Spain. Remember, Spain is a dry Mediterranean in climate. The, the weather is uh, somewhat uh, fairly similar. There's some differences in the distribution of precipitation and whatnot. But the Mediterranean climate that people brought from Spain uh, had prepared them extremely well for uh, surviving and thriving in this uh, homeland and certainly in the village of El Cerrito. So that really is the last of, uh, of the slides I have. If some of you want to ask some questions, we have a few minutes. And if not otherwise, then uh, I guess I will see you in the village uh, at our next outing. Is there anyone who wishes to uh, involve? Or I mean, there we go. I can see you all out there. You're uh, what a handsome crew you are, too, by the way. I've been looking at the board. I'm glad to see you. Anyone wish to uh, raise any questions, or are you uh, ready to do some heavy-duty internal thinking? <laughs>